All right, welcome everyone to the DCS F4 Phantom for Dummies series. In this chapter, we will be covering how to cold start the F4 Phantom in both the pilot seat and Wizzo seat. The checklists for the Phantom are a real laundry list of chores to complete, but unless you like playing with random failures enabled, startup is much simpler than it appears. Now, just like the F14, the F4 cockpit is fully analog and can certainly look like a maze if you haven't familiarized yourself with the cockpit using Heepler's manual. Don't worry though, you won't need to know exactly where everything is. We'll find the location of each and every button, switch, and knob as we go along. So without further ado, let's get this thing started. Now, if you haven't already, let's get ourselves into a fresh jet. Heepler has been kind enough to include many training missions and instant actions to practice your skills, so we'll use one of those to get ourselves started. Now that we're in the cockpit, we can get started. Let's put our helmet on so it's not blocking our view. Simply click on it to put it on. First, we need to get the power turned on. We can do this by going to the Crew Chief menu in the new and improved Jester menu. We open this by hitting A on the keyboard. Next, select the Crew Chief option to open the menu, and we'll hover over the external power option and select Connect. You'll actually be able to see the ground power line change visual models on the start cart to your left. With external power connected, we can look to the outboard on the right sidewall and flip both of the generator switches to aft for external power. From here, let's look to the throttle quadrant and flip forward the engine master switches located to the right of the throttles. Then, using the crew chief menu, connect the external air source to the right engine. You'll hear the crew chief respond by saying you're connected. You'll have to ask the crew chief to turn the air on through the menu, so let's do that. To find out if the air is flowing to the engine, we'll take a look at the right engine tachometer located on the right side of the front panel. Here we're looking for 10% RPM on the gauge. Once that's been established, we can finally start the engine. To do this, we need to bind the right ignition button located on the throttle. Once bound, we will hit the right throttle detent to move the throttle from off into idle position. Then we will press and hold the right ignition button, push the throttle halfway, and hold it there for about 3 seconds. Then pull the throttle back to idle and release the ignition button. The engine should be starting now, so let's take a look back at the engine gauges to be sure. Idle RPM should be roughly 65%, which we have here, so we're good to go. With the right engine on, we can move the right engine generator switch that we flipped earlier to external from its aft position to forward. The right engine startup is now complete. Now we need to repeat the process for the left engine, so let's connect the air to the left engine and turn the airflow on. Once the left tachometer hits 10%, we'll move the throttle out of the detent, press and hold the left ignition button, Push the left throttle halfway forward for about 3 seconds, then return the throttle to idle, and let go of the ignition button. Check to see if the left engine RPMs are stable at 65%, and finally, flip the left power switch from aft to forward. Once you've successfully started up both engines and switched from external to main engine power, Jester will prompt you on which INS alignment you wish to do, if you're flying solo. You can choose either a full alignment, which can take a while to complete, or the bath alignment, which stands for best available true heading. This is a fairly imprecise alignment and can leave you lost if you plan to rely heavily on the nav system, but it'll do in a pinch for things like short range interceptions and scrambles. If stored heading is enabled in the mission, or you are restarting the jet after a shutdown, then there is also the option for a heading memory mode, which is the F4 Phantom's version of stored heading alignment in other jets. For now, we'll select the full INS alignment. While that's aligning, let's go ahead and switch everything else on. Let's disconnect the external power and air first. 
Now, for the actual switches, we'll go left to right for simplicity. So first, we'll enable the stability augmentation system for the pitch, roll, and yaw axes. From there, we'll move forward to reset our static pressure compensator, which is a system that helps correct our barometric altimeter during rapid altitude changes. Just push the switch forward and it will clear the static correlation off light on the enunciator panel. Moving on, we will enable our oxygen system located further forward in the cockpit and make sure it's on normal oxygen. Left of that is the anti-skid switch, which will flip to on. Just forward of that is the external light switch that we will flip up for taxi lights. Moving on to the front instrument panel, we'll turn the radar altimeter on by rotating the big silver knob. Just set that to your desired altitude. Moving down from there to this lower panel which holds the G-meter and some extra engine gauges, we have the DSCG screen mode switch which we will flip up to enable our radar display. Then up to the actual DSCG panel where we'll put the HUD into standby mode. We have the barometric altimeter which we will left click and hold the turn switch for 3 seconds to reset it. Then we'll move down to the standby ADI and just left click the knob to remove the flag. Next, we'll move back up to the right of the DSCG panel to enable our ALR-47 radar warning receiver by just hitting the power button located on the bottom row to the very right. Keep in mind that the WIZO also has control over the RWR, so be sure not to accidentally turn it off. After that, we'll move to the right sidewall all the way to the front to set up our TACAN. Switch the power knob from off to transmit receive and set the channel as desired with the two knobs to the left. From there, we'll move Move back to the radio and turn it to transmit receive plus guard and set our frequency as desired. Behind that is the IFF panel which we will just switch to norm. And lastly, we'll turn the pitot tube heat on just in case it gets a bit chilly up there. Now, if it's a bit dark outside and therefore inside your jet, the cockpit light controls are located at the very back right of the pilot seat. So go ahead and set those as desired. And that's it. All we need to do now is wait for Jester to let us know that the INS is complete. Alignment completed. You can go primary sync now. Alright, ready to taxi. With the INS complete, there's just one more thing we need to do. Head on over to the front panel of the cockpit and flip the reference system switch from standby to primary. Then we'll head on down to the very back right of the cockpit to this little area known as the compass control panel. We'll left click and hold the mode selector knob into the sync position for 3 seconds. This knob is spring loaded to return to the default slave position, so just let go when done. And with that complete, we're ready to rock and roll. So let's close up the canopy and take to the skies. Okay, real quick before we move on to the Wizzo startup, let's learn how to start the engines using the cartridge start system. These cartridges are essentially really big shotgun shell blanks that are used to jumpstart the compressor in place of the start cart. Cartridge starting is a mode typically used only in emergencies or during operations in which a start cart is unavailable, so you won't need to worry about connecting external power for this. That being said, you may want to use the system for a slightly faster startup. The way we do this is by asking the crew chief to load cartridges located in the air source menu. The crew chief will load one cartridge for each engine, so just wait for him to respond saying they've been loaded. Carts loaded, sir. With the cartridges loaded, we can start the engine. First, we enable the engine master switches just like before. Then we will move the right throttle from the off detent into the idle position. Next, we will need to actually fire the cartridges off. To do this, we look to the engine start switch located to the right of the static pressure compensator. This switch has a left and right position corresponding to the left and right engine respectively. Let's go ahead and push the switch to the right. You should hear the cartridge ignite, or at the very least, you'll hear the compressor start to spin up. Now let's look back at the right engine tachometer to confirm we have at least 10% RPM. Then we'll quickly hit our right ignition button, push the throttle halfway forward for about 3 seconds ensuring positive startup, and return it to the idle position. It's important to note that you need to act fairly quickly when doing the cartridge start because unlike the airflow from the start cart, this cartridge can only keep the compressor spinning for a few seconds. With the right engine at 65%, we can go ahead and enable the right engine generator just like in the normal start to provide our Phantom with much needed electricity. Then we just repeat the process for the left engine. When the left engine has spun up, just flip the left engine generator switch forward and we are good to complete the rest of the startup as normal. Oh by the way, check out how fast you can do a double engine cartridge start.
Parts loaded, sir. Talk about a scramble, huh? Alright, now for all the aspiring Wizzos out there, let's learn how to cold start our part of the jet. Unfortunately, to ensure that the Wizzo half of the startup goes off without a hitch, the pilot will have to finish starting the engines before we can begin. Now, starting from the back left, let's turn on the radio to transmit receive plus guard, and set the channel as needed. Forward of that is the tack end, which we'll set to our desired mode and channel. Forward of that and underneath the throttle at the top of the radar control panel is our radar power knob, which we will set to standby for now. Further forward is our oxygen controls, which we'll turn on and set to normal. Then up to the instrument panel to remove the standby flag from the altimeter by left clicking and holding on the bottom right switch for 3 seconds. From there, we'll move up to our ALR-46 radar warning receiver control panel and hit the power button to start the warm up process. Be careful though because the pilot also has control of the RWR, so you don't want to fight over who is turning this on and off. Then we'll move way down to the center of the console and switch our DSCG from off to standby. Lastly we'll need to turn on our navigation computer, which is located at the back right of the cockpit. If this is a fresh jet, the coordinates should already be preset into the computer, but it helps to double check using the kneeboard. All we need to do for now is turn this large knob on the corner from off to standby. We'll learn how to actually use the navigation system in a later chapter. And with that, and with that, all that's left to do is the INS alignment. There are three distinct ways to align the AN-ASN-63 inertial navigation system for the F4E. The primary method is the gyro compass alignment, which is the longest method, but also provides the most accurate alignment for any given situation. There are two other methods, but we'll talk about those in a moment. To perform a gyro compass alignment, first we must preheat the gyroscopes so that they can align properly. To do this, we will go to the INS panel, located in front of the radar control stick, and turn it once to the standby position. Upon doing this, the red heat lamp should illuminate, letting you know the INS is warming up. Now we need to wait until the heat lamp turns off before we can select the alignment option. Unfortunately, this takes about 6 minutes depending on the ambient air temperature. You can use the stopwatch function located on the in-cockpit clock to time the INS process. So I'll be back when the warm-up process is complete. With the heat lamp finally extinguished, we have successfully completed a course alignment. To perform a fine alignment, just turn the knob one more time to the align setting. Now, we must wait about 75 seconds, give or take, for the align lamp to light up. Once the light is turned on, the fine alignment has been completed, but we must wait a bit longer before the actual gyro compass alignment of the INS is complete. This will take about another 5 minutes. We know the gyro compass alignment is complete when the green lamp begins to flash on on and off. Once flashing, all we need to do is turn the INS knob one more time to the nav setting and your INS is now fully aligned. Keep in mind, while gyro compass is the most accurate method, it still has a circular error probability of 3 nautical miles per hour. So if you plan to fly for a long time, you'll need to perform regular INS fixes which we'll cover in a later chapter. Now let's do a best available true heading alignment, otherwise known as bath. This is more or less like 
like shotgunning the INS alignment and, while usable, is not super accurate, so it's best to use this only when time is of the essence. To perform the bath alignment, simply turn the knob momentarily to the standby position, ensure that the heat lamp turns on, and then immediately switch it over to the align setting. From here, the alignment process should take roughly 2 minutes and 15 seconds. You'll know it's ready because the align lamp will turn on. Once the lamp is on, simply switch the INS to nav mode which will extinguish the heat and align lamps, and voila, your bath alignment is complete. Now this being the most inaccurate alignment method, bath has a circular error probability of 5.5 nautical miles per hour in the best case scenario, so if you plan to do more than just a quick sortie, you'll need to regularly fix the INS to ensure minimal drift. Again, we'll learn this in another chapter. Finally, we have the heading memory alignment. This is functionally the same as the good old stored heading alignment you're used to in other aircraft. In the F4E, this is only usable if the plane hasn't moved since you last turned it off, or in the case of DCS, if the stored heading option is enabled in the mission editor. To perform this alignment, we simply have to do what we did for the bath alignment, but with one key difference. We have to flip up this red safety cover on the INS panel and flip the switch forward into the heading memory mode. If this is a fresh start on the mission and stored heading is enabled, then the cover will already be up and the switch enabled. Then we'll just do what we did for bath. Turn the knob from off to standby, making sure the heat lamp turns on, then immediately turning the knob into the align position. From here, we just need to wait for the align lamp to turn on, which should take a little over 2 minutes, just like the bath alignment. This time, once the alignment is complete, the align lamp flashes on and off just like a full gyro compass alignment. Then we just need to turn the knob to the nav position, and we're all done. For reference, the memory heading alignment will have a circular error probability of, at best, the gyro compass alignment, or, at worst, 5.5 nautical miles per hour, similar to the best case scenario scenario for bath alignment. With our INS alignment fully complete, let's close up the canopy and let our pilot know we're ready to taxi. And with that, you are now ready to fully cold start the jet in the simplest way possible. This should be enough to get you going so you can learn all the cool stuff like shooting missiles and dropping bombs. In the next chapter, however, we'll be taking it slow and talking about how to taxi, take off, and do both a visual and ILS landing. Until then, please let me know what you thought of this tutorial in the comments down below, and be sure to ask questions if you have any. Either myself or another member of the community will be sure to answer them to the best of our abilities. If you want to see more videos from me and stay up to date on when more F4 Phantom videos are published, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. It's very much appreciated. And with all that out of the way, I want to thank you all so very much for watching, and have a nice day.